Hey hey, Marcus House with you here. Over at SpaceX's Starbase at Boca Chica this week, all effort seems focused on the first orbital test flight of Starship with everything on site looking more refined by the day. Ships coming down, ships moving out, and a load of intriguing stuff to cover this week. Cygnus NG-18 made its way up to resupply the International Space Station, however there was an unexpected hiccup. A final farewell to United Launch Alliance's Atlas V from Vandenberg in the spectacular JP SS2 mission. SLS makes its way back to the launch pad for another attempt at its maiden flight, but whoa, this doesn't look like smooth sailing just yet, does it? All this and a bunch more, so suit up and boot up as we rip through another week of space action. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. This week started off with more testing of the full stack, Booster 7 and Ship 24. Along with that, some great action with Ship 25. We'll start off on Sunday night though, where the orbital launch mount's work platform was lowered down from Booster 7. The next day in the morning, the orbital tank farm began to vent, and another cryogenic liquid flow was underway into the booster's methane tank. After what seemed like another successful test, half an hour later the frost line began to recede. Now, one awesome thing that I'm not sure many may have noticed is the ship quick disconnect moving away from ship 24. Just look at that cryogenic liquid pouring out. That is a pretty awesome test and I suspect that must have been part of some kind of launch rehearsal. Another test that same day with the suborbital tank farm firing up to load cryogenic propellant into ship 25's tanks. After about three hours or so of loading into the liquid oxygen tank, the vehicle was depressurized to conclude the testing for that day. Late on Monday, the orbital launch mount work platform was moved back up to Booster 7 following all of that testing. The next morning, the LR11000 crane was hooked back up to Ship 25, with the massive 50 metre tall beast being lifted into the air and carefully placed onto the transport stand here. This lift was actually done quite quickly as the crane was detached from the ship the same day. And yep, look at that. It was on the move exiting the launch site only six hours after being lifted, arriving at the production facility an hour later. Its destination, the high bay later that evening. It did quickly peek back out again with what looked like the teams swiftly removing the counterweights from the self-propelled modular transporters so that they could complete the drop-off and drive away from underneath the vehicle. Now, you may be asking why SpaceX moved it back. Well, the hope, of course, is that it is here to have some final work done, along with Raptor engine installation. This is, of course, assuming that the cryogenic tests have all gone to plan and that there aren't any unknown repairs to be done. Perhaps as an added bonus, it may also have been moved into the high bay here simply for protection from the elements until Booster 9 testing has been completed. Now, while all this was happening, over at the orbital launch area we see some pretty big events unfolding. Backtracking to earlier that same day, the ship Quick Disconnect was disconnected from Ship 24. The entire Quick Disconnect arm then swung away. Early in the afternoon, the lift finally started and the full stack was no more. Ship 24 here being lifted off Booster 7, swung around and then lowered down onto the transport stand. Now, I think that this D-stack seemed to go a lot quicker and smoother than what we've seen in the past. And as the automation of this system has improved, it is looking much more routine. Now, after all of this quite repetitive looking cryogenic testing over the last couple of weeks, it may seem like progress has halted. Never fear though, because as we have learned from the NASA committee just recently, with all of these tests, SpaceX are progressively ironing out all of the previously untested procedures. Now that Ship 24 has been destacked from Booster 7, I'm sure that we're going to see some fiery action again very soon, hopefully this coming week. In fact, to prepare for all of this, Ship 24 was moved over to suborbital pad B and a few hours later it was lifted on top. Now, something else quite significant also was discovered at the orbital launch site very recently. Potential cladding for the tower looks to have arrived in preparation to be installed. We've also seen over the last two weeks some upgrades happening to the cladding mounts on the tower itself. Lower down, the SpaceX crew took off the old mounts 
and installed new ones that look much thicker and stronger. So yes, I'm hoping that we're going to be seeing this cladding installed soon because it's going to completely change the look of the massive tower and make it look a lot closer to the renders that we've seen by SpaceX in the past. It does make a lot of sense installing this now. You want that protection in place before the orbital flight attempt, perhaps also for more protection against the substantial 33 engine static fire as well. A rapid unscheduled disassembly in such a test could have some pretty bad consequences, not just for the wiring of the colossal tower arms, but also the propellant lines to the ship and much more. On Thursday, SpaceX were finally getting back to the next phase of testing, that being spin prime tests and soon to come static fires. The work platform having been moved off the night before meant that the road closed nice and early the following morning. The arms climbed back up the tower to prepare for this event and Booster 7 there even deciding to give the audience a quick wave with the grid fins. Nice. The booster testing started off with an ambient pressure test and propellant was loaded into the liquid liquid oxygen tank. Engine chilling kicked off, and not long after that, check that out, the fire suppression system roared to life. This was it, spin prime of Booster 7 engines. So yes, it is now fire time again as the excitement gears up for the most powerful static fire to date. Seven engines at once is the record, and I think that we are going to see double that for the next one. This is going to be epic. Okay, so last week you may recall that I talked about this new tent going up. Well, SpaceX sure wants this up quick, as these images beautifully captured by Starship Gazer show that the team is not only rapidly adding the last steel beams, but also all of the insulation required. Now, to me, the addition of this insulation means that the tent is probably going to be staying around for quite a long time, I presume until the Star Factory has been fully constructed. Remember, the entire factory is much bigger than what we see here. It's eventually going to expand out to replace the large production tents. Over at the Mega Bay, RGV Aerial Photography snapped this awesome picture peeking into the corner. This is Booster 10 already having at least one of its grid fins added. Later on in the week, another one was seen heading in as well. We have future ship items to update you on also. The massive downcomer that we think is allocated to Ship 26 was seen heading into the high bay, followed by it being lifted into its tank section. If you recall, this is the component that allows methane to flow down through the center of the liquid oxygen tank to the engines. The weird thing is, later in the week, a downcomer was also moved out of the high bay, no longer wrapped. That could be the same one, or perhaps not, so we're keeping an eye out to see how that progresses. Ship 27's payload barrel also got its door for the Pezlink dispenser, and man, do those dispensers look like a work of art now. This is probably some of the last work required before the nose cone can be stacked on top, which is sitting here in the ring yard. Speaking of nose cones, the one for the next ship in line, Ship 28, is progressing quite nicely too. Most of the heat shield tiles have been installed now, and only those around the flap aero covers are missing. And yes, in this picture, the nose cones for both Ship 29 and Ship 30 are both visible. Man, what a production line that we have got here now. Another awesome development for Ship 25 is the Starlink loader was moved out of the Starlink processing building Wednesday afternoon. A possible Starlink truck, the same that we saw in July, backed up into the building dropping off some version 2 satellites. It has been quite a while since we've last seen this with Ship 24 in the high bay, so this is all great to see. And I've just got to say, if those live stream cameras by NASA Spaceflight and Lab Padre were not available for all of us to study, there would be so much missing here. Likewise, the photography during the week by Starship Gazer is just so neat and detailed, you really get that sense of scale of these colossal rocket prototypes. Now all of this is because of you there in the incredible community supporting what they do by helping with Patreon or whatever method is best for them. That helps them out more than you could imagine, just as it does right here. Subscribing super useful, but you know, I don't want you to think that I'm pressuring you, I just think that you are super amazing no matter what, so you do you. 
Now, while putting the finishing touches to this segment, some media news broke yesterday. I was initially reluctant to include it as I'm yet to see an official SpaceX response, possibly all a bit speculative for now. But if confirmed, SpaceX's president and COO Gwen Shotwell and Vice President Mark Huncolsa are reported to now be managing Starbase activities in Texas. Then Sam Patel, the senior director, is moving to Starbase Florida operations instead. So quite the shake up there. Personally, I'm seeing this as adding further resources to the program to kick it into a higher gear. Regardless, until we hear from SpaceX leadership on this for confirmation, probably need to take all that with a grain of salt. Okay, so almost a week ago, the 18th commercial resupply mission for Northrop Grumman to the International Space Station was on the pad, ready to go. Set to lift off from Wallops Island, Virginia on Sunday the 6th, the countdown was progressing well. With about 15 minutes to go though, there was a halt to the proceedings. Turns out there was a fire alarm of all things, but nothing to do with the pad or the rocket. The issue was over at Northrop Grumman's Cygnus Spacecraft Control Center instead, with the staff needing to evacuate the building Building, there was no choice but to regroup and have another go the next day. Finally, at 5.32 a.m. local time the next morning, Antares roared off the pad carrying the Cygnus spacecraft named SS Sally Ride after America's first woman in space. There was not much seen of the ascent. I did find the telemetry here rather interesting to observe. Right here, main engine cutoff, followed by the stage separation. Now, just what was going on here with this little pirouette? There was no indication of anything being off nominal at all. This we think instead was an intentional way to burn off some extra fuel to account for the fact that the rocket probably had a little bit too much performance in its first stage. Because the second stage is powered by a solid propellant, you can't just turn them off when they get to their designated orbit. They need to instead finish their burn off completely, so an intentional retrograde burn to waste a little performance would make sure that it doesn't overshoot the mark. Very interesting anyway. The SS Sally Ride was soon in orbit, chasing down the International Space Station with over 3.7 tons of assorted science, provisions and other cargo, as well as propellant to be used for the ISS reboost maneuvers. Now, another interesting part of this mission is that there was an issue with one of the two solar arrays here, which did not deploy. Northrop Grumman with NASA made the decision not to reattempt that deployment, as the single solar array can still do the job alone. It does seem, though, that one of Antares' acoustic blankets was lodged into the deployment mechanism there. Quite unusual, but it didn't seem to cause any issues. After the 48-hour chase down, we had Nicole here with Josh as a backup at the ISS controls, the robotic armor making a successful capture about 10 meters out before the robotic specialists back on Earth took over, berthing Cygnus to the Earth-facing port of the Unity module. Soon to follow the unpacking of the cargo, before the usual cleanup and reloading of the spacecraft with unwanted items destined for a fiery disposal in the upper atmosphere. That should happen around three months from now. So what is next for Antares? Northrop Grumman has issues around being able to purchase the Russian-made engines, of course, and they are then used to power the Ukrainian-made first stage. Due to that very limited supply, we are expecting only one more launch of this Antares 230 Plus type around spring of 2023. The plan is then to work with Firefly Aerospace for the proposed Antares 330 model, anticipated to fly sometime in 2024. That does leave quite a gap, though. In the meantime, SpaceX are now going to be launching three Cygnus capsules into orbit with Falcon 9. Over to the West Coast midweek, United Launch Alliance had their Atlas V 401 rocket on the pad at Space Launch Complex 3 East at Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. Now, as indicated by the 401 configuration, we have the 4 meter payload fairing, zero solid rocket boosters, and just the single RL 10 engine on the second stage. This is for the very last time as well. No more Atlas Vs are going to ever launch from here again. The rideshare mission was away taking an advanced weather satellite and a technology demonstrator into space. The climb up hill here was super quick, all the expected rapid sequence of events from separation to fairing jettison going well, and the burn time of the second stage engine went through its lengthy burn phase as we finally came to the payload separations. The primary payload for this mission, the Joint Polar Satellite System Number 2. NASA and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration had the Advanced Polar Orbiting Weather Satellite 
are destined for sun-synchronous low Earth orbit. Weather prediction capabilities with twice daily observations means short and long-term forecasts will be greatly enhanced. The data gathering from these satellites consists of imagery, atmospheric temperature and humidity profiles, land and ocean surface temperature measurements, and ozone level readings as well. It's really great to see the advancement in all of this technology. Personally though, in this mission, I think the more interesting component of this flight is the low Earth orbit flight test of an inflatable decelerator, or LOFTID. Lofted. Yes, this was released on a re-entry trajectory soon after the JPSS-2 satellite reached orbit. This spicy demonstration aims to gather data on the inflatable aeroshell and heat shield as it rapidly slows down to survive the punishment of re-entry. Following that, a soft splashdown off the east coast in Hawaii for eventual recovery. Now, my good mate Brenton working with me here got some neat information out of United Launch Alliance's CEO Tori Bruno on this early in the week. This demonstrator was created as a half-scale version of the real deal, measuring 6 metres or 20 feet in diameter. As stated here, United Launch Alliance plans to recover the first stage engine compartment for Vulcan in the future using this technology. I just can't wait to see that. Now, as I mentioned quickly in last weekend's video, NASA's huge space launch system rocket had just rolled back to Pad 39B that arrived around 8.30 a.m. Eastern Time on November the 4th. Emerging from the Vehicle Assembly Building, or VAB, roughly nine hours earlier, this sure is quite an impressive sight. While the trip back to the pad was underway, though, out at sea, a tropical depression was forming. It was deemed an okay risk to proceed with plans to leave the VAB, but soon, this weather was developing into Tropical Storm Nicole. Now, hang on. This all sounds eerily familiar, doesn't it? Weather forecasts at the time indicated that although storm activity will impact the launch site, wind gusts were not expected to exceed the structural limits of the SLS. Weather is a fickle beast though, and this all changed as the week progressed. Was it time to instead head back to the VAB? More on that in just a moment, but first, today's video is supported by Underlucky Stars. They make these incredible personalized star maps that show the unique alignment of the stars in a place and time chosen by you. I organized this one here for our home, all set up on the day my wife and I got married, and it is such a great keepsake to have. Such a map could reflect any important event in your life though. Another obvious option would have been having one for the kid's birthday as well, but it can be anything meaningful to you. All you need to do is enter the location and time of the special moment that you wish to commemorate, and then Under Lucky Stars will show you exactly how these stars look at the time time with an amazing print of a map of the sky. That shows the constellations and star placements for you on your special moment. There are over 15 designs to choose from which will be printed on museum quality thick art paper at 300 dpi quality. Beautiful, durable, and then you have the frame selection. Six elegant options to select from, so it's very customizable. I picked the moon style here and the black frame with mounting, but you do you. Under Lucky Stars have a proprietary method of generating these star maps, also verified by NASA astrophysicists to ensure accuracy. As a side note, Under Lucky Stars also help support the International Dark Sky Association, working to protect the night sky for present and and future generations. These are a great, heartfelt, personal and memorable display. Very unique, and they are also providing you with a 10% discount to make it even more special. Just head to underluckystars.com slash Marcus and use code Marcus to get your loved one a unique gift. The link is in the description. Okay, so the tropical storm got wild, with measurements getting up to 82 miles per hour. In the aftermath, the orange rocket appeared okay, but there is minor damage around needing inspection and attention. The launch date had already been bumped from the 14th to the 16th as a result of the weather, but I suspect things may still slip. With SLS having launched backup dates of November the 19th and 25th, anything beyond that is going to mean re-evaluating that flight termination system like we saw in September. On the plus side though, while the investigation into the hydrogen leak ultimately found no smoking gun, confidence in the management of the propellant loading is much higher now. On top of that, the countdown process has been adjusted to include more time in the holds, and there has been some changes in the propellant loading timelines to help with any 
potential further issues. Should the launch still not happen by the final backup window of November the 25th, the SLS is expected to remain at the pad for a December launch opportunity. Now this is where things could get quite interesting, the certification of the two solid rocket boosters. These were stacked in early 2021, and the deadline for their use, yet again, expires on December 19th and 14th respectively. NASA would then need to reassess at that point. Let's instead hope that a November launch goes to plan, because if we are still covering this in December, who knows how much longer it could be delayed. So that is about it for the week. A little excitement from Australia as well, which I'll get to in just a second. But a big thank you to you for being here, watching all this way through each and every week. From what I've ever been able to tell from the mystery that is the YouTube algorithm, the uh, watch time seems to be the most important metric to determine how far these videos are shared. Even more than likes, subscriptions and all that stuff, you make this channel what it is. And the team and I super appreciate it, I can tell you right now. We've got all of the incredible patrons and YouTube members here helping us out other great individuals buying the merch as well. All super amazing of you. So as a sign off here, here is a little slice of excitement from my neck of the woods. Gilmore Space Technologies in Queensland, Australia dropped the video early this week demonstrating Sirius, a hybrid rocket engine which they state is the most powerful engine ever developed in Australia. This neat unit will power their Australian made Eris rocket to orbit next year if all goes to plan. The engine has passed the final qualification test here and also at the same time, this was a test to destruction. Boom, there it goes. Let's just check that out in slow-mo. The thrust of Sirius here is around 115 kilonewtons, and there's going to be four of these to power the first stage of that Ares rocket. Now, that is a total of 460 kilonewtons, or almost 47 tons of force. That sits somewhere between Astra's rocket at about 355 kilonewtons and Firefly Alpha at around 736. This style of engine is typically seen as one with more flexibility than, say, solid rocket motors, which, once you light them, are running until they burn out. Although a hybrid uses a solid grain fuel of some sort, there is a separate oxidizer which can simply be shut off or throttled down as needed. They are also typically safer to handle than liquid propellants, which are normally needing to be pressurized a great deal, especially for cryogenic liquid propellants. The hybrids here are seen a lot of the time as a nice middle ground, so hopefully we'll get to see the Ares rocket preparing to fly very soon. Now, perhaps you are interested in some of the deeper dive topics covered here on screen. They are not the typical weekend news videos, and it seems like people like these even more a lot of the time. We love making them as well, so let me know if any topic interests you more than any other. And thanks again for watching all this way through. Have a terrific weekend, and I'll see you for the next video.